Are you back? I am back on a new computer in a new office. <laughs> All right, let's get you in. Let's hope this works. Where's my list here? I'm having trouble here finding your name. Oh, she's not under her name. She's under her yeah, She's got a different name, Donna. Where'd she go? She's under Dewey Ellsworth. That's her. Oh, here we go. Sorry. What's your name now? Um, let's see, probably Dewey Ellsworth. I'm on my husband's computer. Yes, it is. I can change it. I'm Here we go. All right. Okay. Now, can you guys bear with me? I'm going to put this on Facebook. I don't know that this is going to allow this in his either. What? Crazy. Yeah, I am. Um, it's it's going for the exact same systems preferences piece. Oh, no. So. Maybe I won't put this on Facebook. I am so sorry, Donna. I, you know, can you send me those slides? I can, but here's the thing. There are, oops, I'm just going to scroll through. I speak with a lot of slides. There are 118 for 30 minutes. Because well, I, I use a lot of word examples. I have no idea how I would cue you. Just say click. <laughs> Well, should we try it? I mean, it's not ideal, but That's yeah, for some reason, my Apple will not allow here. Let me do one thing. Let me ask my husband what his password is. I'm so sorry. These things happen. What's your password for your computer? All right. Can um, I spell I, out the whole word? I think they are an hour long. They might be 45 minutes. I'll ask her. That's a good question. Yes. OK, so tonight is free, but the rest of the series, there's five in the series for $15. Oh, okay. well, maybe. We'll Tonight see. is separate. Tonight's like an introduction. All right, I'm going to let you go and see. All right, let's see. Did that work? Do you see my screen? I do not. All right, let's try again. Oh my gosh. It's working. All righty. Yay. <laughs> we have some progress. We found a new computer. We're rolling with it. Thank you everyone for being patient. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, well, I'm ready to roll when you are, so you can let me know. We are here tonight with Denise Eide, and I don't think I have a intro for you. I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> That's okay. So she, I don't think you need an introduction, actually. You are well known for your understanding the logic of English, and um, you have an incredible company. I encourage everyone to go to your books, your um, your site, because there's so much information and in it will make your head spin. And without further ado, Denise, <laughs> I'm sorry. 
Well, no, thank you all for being patient as I work through some technical issues and I get to present from my husband's office for the very first time ever. So that's pretty exciting, a little change of scenery. <laughs> so welcome to the book study for uncovering the logic of anguish. And I thought I would open this study um, by telling you a little bit about the inspiration for the book. So you'll get a little inside story as to how uncovering the logic of English and logic of English, the company even came to be. And it all goes back to when my twin sons, Abraham and Josiah were about this age and they were learning to read. And here's the thing, I really believed in surrounding them with books um, from the time they were infants, I read to them. We would go to the library and get whole laundry baskets full of books. And we would sit for like half an hour or an hour every evening. We didn't even own a television at this time in their lives because I had this passion for sharing literacy with them. I wanted them to love reading. And they would listen to audiobooks at night. And so when it was time for them to learn to read, you know, they learned that S said S as in socks. And then they could read words like sit and sat and stop and fast. And then they would get to this word, his, and they would read it, his. Mm -hmm. And I'm not joking, every single time. And I would say, use your context clues. That's a sight word. That's an exception. <laughs> and they started to get really frustrated. And they learned things like A says as an apple. And they even learned that A says A is in grapes with a silent E and A says it's long sound at the end of the syllable. And then they came across words like all and water and called, and they would read it as Al and waiter. And I would once again be like, no, no, that's a sight word. <laughs> And it began to become quite honestly like torture for all of us. And they started to dis just fall out of love with books. In fact, they would start to cry when they were reading. Mm. And you can imagine, right, with this word, what did they misread it as? They misread hey. it as cave. Hey. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I felt just so torn up inside because I tried to do everything right. Does that make sense? And present them with all the information they needed. So that's really the backstory to uncovering the logic of English. That's my journey as a mom. And that kind of leads us a little bit into chapter two because when my sons were struggling with reading, I thought I was completely alone. My older daughter was like me. She just learned to read very quickly and naturally. And I was so surprised to come across this journey. And then I learned the literacy statistics. And we're not gonna delve into these deeply tonight, but I just like you to be aware that 64% of students in 2017 in the fourth grade read, read below grade level. And I was shocked because my experience as a parent at the, at the time was telling me my boys were the exception, right? But the literacy statistics actually say my daughter, who was an advanced reader, was the exception. Only 9% of fourth graders are advanced readers. And in fact, only 27% are proficient. And that really began to open my eyes. Not only was I not alone or my son's not alone, it opened my eyes to the fact that this is a massive problem in the United States because I understood that reading is the foundation of all of education. And I also have since learned that this is the same in all English speaking countries. So I went on a journey searching for answers and it was a long journey. It actually took a couple years. And in that time, my sons did not love reading anymore. It was still torture reading and we still kept at it. And, but I stumbled across materials that explain the phonograms and spelling rules. And that's really what uncovering the logic of English is at its heart about. And we'll talk about it in more detail in a few minutes. But as my sons learned the phonograms and spelling rules, something magical happened. <laughs> it took them about four months to master all the phonograms. We practiced them every single day and applied them to words through spelling. And we began to learn the spelling rules. And I didn't have a good systematic curriculum to do this. Um, it was just introducing these concepts and spelling words together. But the magical thing that happened 
is they suddenly could read, not just Sam sat like they could before, but they could read the chapter books that they were listening to as audiobooks. So here's a little tidbit um, about the science of reading that is not in uncovering, but I think will help place the book in its context. The simple view of reading is now pretty widely accepted. And it says that the that decoding skills times oral language comprehension equals your ability to read and comprehend. So why is this a times? The reason it's a times is this. First, let's focus on oral language comprehension. I know how to sound out all of the letters in Russian, but I can't listen to someone speak in Russian and comprehend it. That means I can't decode and read and comprehend because I can't listen and comprehend. So a zero in a spot means you can't perform reading comprehension either. Well, weak decoding skills with strong oral language comprehension skills also mean you struggle with reading comprehension. So what happened as my sons learned the phonograms and spelling rules is they gained strong decoding skills by being surrounded by books in their home, they had strong oral language comprehension skills. And that meant it was almost miraculous, right? That they could read and comprehend when they gained those strong decoding skills. So it was that experience of watching this transform the lives of my sons that made me write this book because I was like, everybody should know this. And another little secret, I couldn't spell despite having gone to grad school in curriculum and instruction, I had to spell check everything. And as I helped my sons learn the phonograms and spelling rules, I learned to spell. The other thing that happened for my sons is all of a sudden they loved reading again. All of the tears disappeared. And to this day, they love books and they love to read. So let's go and explore a little bit more. In chapter three, it's all about phonograms and phonograms are really the building blocks of words. So many times we teach English as if it's about letters, but instead it's about phonograms, which are pictures of sounds. And phonograms in English can have one letter like this, which says t. They can be spelled with two letters like sh. They can be spelled with three letters like i, and they can be spelled with four letters like A. So you can see how a phonogram can be spelled with one, two, three, or four letters. And these each represent sounds. So let's go back to this one. I sometimes joke that this is the phonogram that led to everything because it was my first aha moment when I picked up this book about phonograms and spelling rules. So it really does say as in it's and see and so in first. But it also says z as in is. Now, I've taken some time uh, in this presentation for your sakes to actually use fry words in here because I want you to see how it's not, it's the high frequency words as well as any word in English that is explained by these phonograms and spelling rules. But this is the number of words that use z in just the first 100 fry words. Pretty impressive, isn't it? And kids will misread these if they don't learn from the beginning that this says both s and z. So one of the big keys when you're teaching phonograms is teach both sounds right from the beginning. So this says s and z, two sounds. Then they have what they need to decode words with that phonogram. Here's another one, right, that I brought up. Now we often teach a and a, but it also says a. And if you notice there's the short and the long sound, that sound with two dots is called the broad sound. And there are a few vowels in English that have short, long and broad sounds. The problem is most of the phonics that we've been taught only teach us short and long. And when we skip those broad sounds, we are missing thousands of words. And that means we are telling students thousands and thousands of times, that's an exception, memorize it by rote, rather than giving them the tools they need to decode those words. This is one of my favorites. I always like sharing this one because I have my own personal story with this. So I was taught that this says ch as in each and which and much. And I can tell you, I can picture sitting in my desk in second grade and the spelling word for that week was school. And I said, 
that is so dumb. That says jewel. I thought English was stupid. But what's interesting, right, was I was one of those one third of kids who learned to read pretty intuitively. Who did I blame? I blamed English. But what's interesting and sad is my sons, when they weren't understanding it, were blaming themselves. But what else does this say? It says k, as in school, orchid, chemistry, et cetera. And what else does it say? It says sh as in machine, chef, shoot in Chicago. By the way, the poor kids who live in Chicago and Charlotte, right? Who are seeing this and they're going, that doesn't say Charlotte. So what happens when you're at a spelling bee? Kids at the, at the script spelling bee, they get a hint. What is the hint that they can ask the moderator? They can ask for the origin of the word. And do you know why that helps them? Well, when they hear that the sound k and they hear that the word is from Greek, they know it's spelled with a ch because that is the Greek spelling of the sound k. And when they hear a sound, the sound sh, and they the moderator says that word is from French, they know it's spelled with a ch because this is the French spelling of the sound sh. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? that the kids in these spelling bees aren't rotely memorizing M-A-C-H-I-N-E. They're understanding why the word is spelled that way. So once again, teach all the sounds right from the beginning. This is ch, k, sh. And with young children, I like to make it a train. Ch, k, sh, ch, k, sh. And young children grasp this very early. They don't have to unlearn the concepts when they learn them right from the beginning. Okay, one last phonogram exception before we go on to the next chapter. But many of you who are teachers have probably taught that this says E, and you've probably taught this rule or this tip, two vowels go walking, um, the first one does the talking. And that works for these fry words, each, knee, near, years, et cetera. But look at these fry words. Look how many of just the high frequency words are. This is not looking at the whole language, right? This is just the fry list. What is it saying in these words? It's saying eh. And do you see how each time this says eh, you would have to say that's an exception if you don't teach all the sounds. And it also says a. Eh. So once again, teach all the sounds for the phonogram right from the beginning, e, eh, a. Eh. Now, in this chapter, you will see a list of the phonograms and their sounds. And one of the most remarkable stories that has ever come out of my work with Logic of English um, was a woman um, who called to tell us that she had been given a copy of Uncovering the Logic of English and that she had been illiterate her whole adult life, her whole life. In fact, she struggled so much with reading, she said that her children would read recipes to her. So she really could not read and comprehend, but she um, came in and she said, I use this phonogram chart and my children helped me and I learned all of the phonograms. And then I used that knowledge to read the rest of the book. And then she said, I went on and I read my first Nicholas Sparks novel and absolutely loved it. <laughs> uh, just shocking, right? I mean, but so rewarding. So these are the building blocks of the English language, but understanding all of the sounds that these phonograms make. Then moving on to chapter five and the chapters beyond that begin to introduce spelling rules. Now spelling rules interplay with phonograms and I'm going to just show my favorite consonant spelling rule. So many of us have learned that C says K as in cat, right? And it was a complete revelation to me when I made this discovery with my sons and how to help them that C also says what in these words? It says S as in place and sentence and face and since. So when is it saying S in these words? Do you see the pattern? It's saying S before an E. Do you see that? All of these words, the C is before an E. When is it saying s in city, decided, circle, exercise? Do you see it? Before an I. How about in cylinder, cylinder, cycle, cypress, and spicy? It's saying it before a 
Why? In fact, C always softens to when followed by an E, I, or Y. By the way, as an adult, this made me so happy because I didn't know this, <laughs> even though my background was in curriculum and instruction in teaching English as a second language. What does C say before an A over U is in can, cold, or cut? It says that sound, k, that first sound. And before a consonant like closed, cried, and object, it also says k, as well as at the end of the word is in arc, music, and comic. So here's the full rule. C always softens to s when followed by an E, I, or Y. Otherwise, C says k. Now, many people, when they hear the word logic of English, will come up to me and say something like this. Well, just think of the word circus. See, the C is saying two sounds. Isn't English crazy? And I'm, I'm not joking. People have said these sorts of things to me at conferences, but you can see now why, right? Why does it say s at the beginning of the word? Because it's before an I. And in the second syllable, because it's before an U. Do you see it? By the way, this rule alone explains more than 6,000 words where C softens to s and more than 10,000 words where C says k. And you'll notice the words where C softens to s are some of the more difficult words in our language. They're often multi-syllable words like cytoskeleton. And I, rem I remember being in science classes and going, cytoskeleton, I just don't get it. See why English is crazy. But this explains why, and it is very, very consistent. This helps students to decode these larger words as well as to spell them. It also solves really great spelling dilemmas. Even naturally strong spellers wonder, well, we have the word picnic and we add an ing, why do we add a K? What would this say? Go ahead and say it out loud. Do you see it? It would say picnic sing. Do you see now why we add the K? Because that C always softens to before an E, I, or Y. So we need that K to protect it. So it says picnicking. All right, this is one of my favorites. And when I'm in a large group, this is always fun to interact because we have the word garlic and we're adding a Y to get garlicky. Notice we need to add a K because this would say, what? Garlic C. And once again, it's our rule. C always softens to when followed by an E, I, or Y. And so we add a K. And here's the thing, even naturally strong spellers will all raise their hand when there's hundreds of people in a room and say, that looks strange. But now, do you understand why it's there? So part of my mission with Logic of English is to help people understand the phonograms and spelling rules are not only beneficial to the 60% um, of kids who struggle with spelling or with reading. These rules benefit the kids who are strong with reading and spelling too, because they explain our language. And in fact, what the research is really showing is that when we present this information to young students, to the whole classroom, the kids who would have learned to read in that 30% actually reach their full potential. Many of them are reading at a fifth, sixth, seventh grade level by the end of second, first or second grade, because this information helps them to go all the farther and also they become better spellers. So let's go on to chapter seven. I'm just kind of doing a little highlight of the book for you. Most of you who are teachers um, will recognize this rule. The vowel says it's long sound because of the E, and it explains words like make and these and time and home. And this rule is very important. So listen really carefully because I, want, I don't want you to miss this. This rule explains 50% of silent final E words. Are any of you appalled? 50%? Does that, do you realize that means you are leaving 50% of the words as exceptions with silent E, if that's the only rule you're teaching? So look at these words. Why do we have a silent final E in have, give, move, above, leave? It's not there to make the vowel say it's long sound. Well, in this word have, it is there because English words do not end with V. I'm serious, every time you hear at the end of the word, you need a silent final E. And this rule explains thousands of words. 
And I've had so many students, even honors high school students, tell me, why didn't someone tell me this in kindergarten? Because wouldn't it be much easier to just be told, if you hear at the end of the word, always add an E, rather than trying to figure out, well, that just doesn't look quite right. I'm not sure why. And it helps with this, right? It gets rid of the killing drill of sight words and all the tears where this poor child is misreading this as have. All you have to do is say, oh, honey, why is the E there? That's right, English words don't end with V. This word says have. Here's another one. English words, why is there a silent E in true blue value and continue? Well, English words don't end in U. So the whole rule is English words do not end in V or U. This is the second most common reason for a silent E. Now, you've already learned the reason for the silent final E in these words. If you take a moment and look at voice, sentence, sense, piece, what would they say if you took off the E? What would that say? It would say boik. Do you see it? So the C softens to S because of the E. This is the third most common reason for a silent E in English. By the way, this chapter um, outlines nine reasons for a silent E in English. And I was shocked when I read that. Honestly, as an adult, it was just a complete surprise to me that there were nine reasons, not one. This chapter also explains how to add a suffix to words ending with a silent E. So I normally like to, in a room, ask people, how many of you learn the rule, drop the E when adding ing? I grew up in a very rural part of Northeastern Minnesota. And I thought that this was just part of my Northeastern Minnesota small town rural education. But I have sent surveyed teachers across the country and everyone seems to have heard and been taught and continue teaching, drop the E when adding ing. But I have a question just for you to stop and think about. What about ED? How about LY? How about A-B-L-E? Like there are a lot of suffixes in English. What about M-E-N-T, meant? Why does the rule only tell us about I-N-G? Well, because it doesn't work. <laughs> so some people, very small percentage of the population has learned the rule, drop the E when adding a vowel suffix. And this is quite a bit better, but I want to refine it for you. So we have the word like, and we will add the vowel suffix ing, and notice we drop the E when adding a vowel suffix to make liking. Do you see that? We have the word notice. We add this vowel suffix ing. We drop the E to make noticing. But we have the word notice. We're going to add the suffix able. Why do I keep the E? Do you all see it? What would this say? Do you all see it would say noticable? This is because you need to know why the E was needed before you drop it. So once you know that information, this is not an exception. It is just part of how the rules work. You need the E so that the C says, because C always softens to when followed by an E-R-Y. Let's do just one more. We have the word service. We add able. Notice we keep the E. Why? Because otherwise it would say cervicable. And we keep the E so the C says for serviceable. Do you see that? Once again, even strong spellers struggle with these. But when you understand the rules, it helps everyone. In fact, one of the most powerful parts of the book, Uncovering the Logic of English, is the how to add a suffix to any word flow chart that's found in chapter 10. I think personally, this chart alone was worth all the learning that I did alongside my sons because it gives you a set of questions that you can ask and you just follow the flowchart answering yes or no and you can now accurately add a suffix to any English word. This is a great one just to like print off and keep next to your desk if you struggle with spelling. Let's move on to chapter 11 and a highlight from here. So many of us have learned shun and therefore many of us have taught shun. And it works for words like equation and direction and fraction. 
But what about this fry word division? Do you see a problem? Yeah, it's S-I-O-N, not T-I-O-N. Is this creating any confusion for you? Are you starting to have a suspicion that something is oversimplified? <laughs> well, that's because there are three Latin spellings of sh in English. And by the way, this is so powerful. And most people who have not been introduced to the phonograms and rules look at this and go, that looks so strange. That says sh, but it really does. And this says sh, and this says two sounds. Listen carefully. It says sh and zh. By the way, that sound zh, as in division, do you hear it? It's a voice sound. Zh. This is the only way to spell this in English. Zh. <laughs> And yet most of us don't even know that z is a sound in English, right? And here's another tip. You can often, though not always, look for the English root. So why did we use a CI to spell facial? Well, there's a C in face and we're adding a vowel suffix, I-A-L, so we drop the E and then it reforms to form sh. Notice space, spacious. We use the CI because space has a C. Express uses SI for expression because express ends with an S. Confess, confession. Locate, here's where your T-I-O-N comes in. Locate has a T. Inspect, inspection. Pretty powerful, isn't it? Now, I will be honest with you, some of the words don't have an English root like inspect to go to, but they are Latin roots and they all follow the rules if you know the Latin roots. But this is a spelling tip. You can tell your students to look to the root to know which Latin spelling of sh to use. So we are at a breaking point where I, you can ask me questions about the book, about teaching reading and about your experiences. So if you want to ask a question, you can unmute yourself and ask. We had one question. Uh, is there a study guide to this book? There is not a study guide at this time, um, but that's a great question. OK. Anything um, to OK. I have a question about the um, in the chapter about vowels, um, like the word, I think it was the word rink is considered a short I. And I've seen that in Jolly Phonics, but I hear an E sound, like for I and G, I and K. Um, can you explain to me why am I hearing that? And like, why is that considered a short I? But I always thought of a short I as I. Yeah, that's a great question. So one thing to think about when we think about um, sounds is like colors, there are shades of sound. So if you just close your eyes for a moment and think about green, you can think about hundreds of shades of green, right? And mm. you call them all green. Same with blue. So sounds are also shades of sounds and they're influenced by sounds that are next to them like the n sound or the er sound. And the other thing about sounds and particularly vowels is they're very influenced by dialect. So I'll give you just an example from my Minnesota dialect that can make you all smile. <laughs> I carry my flag in my bag. <laughs> <laughs> but most of you around the country would carry a flag in a bag, right? <laughs> and you can recognize that that's probably the spelling represents how everybody else says it, correct? <laughs> and so my Minnesota students, we can smile and we can go, we say flag and bag and we like our long vowel sounds up here. But the spelling represents the short sound, a, ah, like most of the speakers say it. So what's happening with a word like rink? Well, it's a combination of these things. Some dialects um, move that more towards an E sound just because of the dialect, just like my Minnesota dialect moves that A sound to that long A sound. And it's also because of the distortion next to the N and the ER. Does that make sense? So yeah. it helps students to hear that it's spelled with the shade rink, I, and many speakers will say it more clearly that way. And it's okay, you don't need to change your pronunciation. 
understanding the way that dialects can influence sounds also helps us to become better listeners and better appreciate other dialects and some of those changes. Thank you. You're welcome. We had a couple questions about um, using this with middle schoolers. How, do you have do you have a curriculum that people could follow for middle schoolers or or anyone? Sure. Um, well, two things about that. First of all, we have had uh, schools just uh, middle school teachers and high school teachers read this book chapter by chapter uh, to their students in their English classes or, you know, take a concept at a time and present it during the vocabulary lesson or during, you know, a spelling lesson because this helps to explain all of English words. And we also have our essentials curriculum, which is a curriculum which puts this in the context of lessons. And so that would lay it out and there's instruction. And something else that I'm really excited about um, since uh, March when COVID began, we began putting all of the phonograms instruction and then spelling analysis, using the phonograms and spelling analysis for free on our e-learning site for both essentials and foundations. So if you go and you find our essentials light or foundations light curriculums, there are videos that you can use for free and it'll introduce the concepts and then it will apply them to words and help um, students <clears throat> analyze. Them. Okay, uh, let's see. We got a bunch of questions. Um, did you learn from P Bowers? I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, did you learn from P Bowers and Structured Word Inquiry? S structured Word Inquiry. Um, yeah, this would be like ex analyzing how the words are spelled and yeah. why, understanding why, not just memorizing them by rote, but taking a systematic approach to understanding and analyzing the spelling and then learning the tools to do so yourself. And so are there any websites that you would recommend with structured word inquiry? Um, if you want to do that using the phonograms and spelling rules found in this book, you can go to elearning.logicofenglish.com and then you can look under the foundations menu or the essentials menu and you can look for the light courses in particular. Those are free. Um, those will, um, like I said, introduce the phonograms and then um, analyze the words together. And then there's a whole curriculum which has a lot more in-depth instruction about it as well as okay. well as word analysis. Yeah, thank you. That's You're great. welcome. Okay. Denise, I ordered this book for our entire staff and we've been discussing it. And the thing that I noticed the most is the conversation that the teachers are having at home with their spouses and their children and their grandchildren. So it, it's so neat to see. It is cool. Heather, that's really encouraging for me to hear. Um, I have a really deep belief, and that's part of the premise of this book, right? That until we all know culturally that A says at A, A, because we were taught it in kindergarten and we practiced it and applied it as we were learning words, or we know that E, A says E, A, A, until we, this is part of our culture, we're mm -hmm. not going to solve the literacy crisis in the United States. But as with this information spreads, right? And as people know, oh, English words don't end in V, add an E. I believe that is when we're gonna see dramatic changes in our literacy scores. And mm -hmm. I, I completely understand, keep in mind that oral language skills is a, is a key component, right? To reading comprehension. But what's really holding us back is our decoding skills. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Oh, Denise, I have another question for you. Um, sure. I think this book looks fantastic, by the Thank way. You. Um, but I have a question about students that are typical in their ability, but have short and long term memory and difficulty generalizing. Um, any recommendations for that? Yeah, so students have a variety of, you know, um, they need a variety of length of practice, right? With material to develop mastery. And so that's why when we consult with schools, 
we recommend that these concepts be taught in your mainstream classrooms. And then when you do pull out instruction, when you have kids who aren't mastering it, that they get additional practice in the same concepts. Now they might need to play more games. They might need more contact with it to develop that long-term memory and mastery. But one of the problems with our education systems right now is this, you might learn that A says at and A in your mainstream classroom. And then if you're really lucky and you have a reading specialist with Orton Gillingham training, they'll learn it says ah as well, but right. there's not this consistency. And if you're a child or a struggling reader, you're not able to pull together. Why is this not jiving for me? I'm getting, I'm being taught different facts in different places. Does that make sense? Oh so yeah, we, it does. <laughs> so we really need to provide that additional support and ideally through games. A big part of um, the logic of English is the combining the science of reading with the joy of learning. We want kids to practice this through games and even adults, we practice it through you know, strategy and card games because it should be fun. Because for some people, it does take quite a bit of contact. Um, so are you mastering game uh, recommendations? Uh, for games? Yeah. Uh, actually, at Logic of English 2, on our store, we have a game book um, that's okay. just filled with phonogram games and spelling games. So that's another, you know, resource for you. Um, great. Yeah. No, that is great, really. <laughs> <laughs> Denise, is your website elearning.logicofenglish.com? So the e-learning site is elearning.logicofenglish.com. You can also find our website at logicofenglish.com. And in that top menu, you can get to our e-learning site as well. Okay, that's kind of what I thought. Um, and there's also a store where you could find the game book and things like that, so. Here's a question. How do you help students who don't qualify for speech services distinguish the difference between sh and ch, ch and uh, sh and ch? Yeah, so speech and uh, understanding the sounds and the phonograms all kind of go hand in hand. So one thing that you'll see, for example, in our foundations curriculum is we have actually tips for speech um, sprinkled throughout the curriculum as you're introducing phonograms. And the other resource that we recommend is a book called Eliciting Speech Sounds. And that book, um, is used by speech therapists to help students produce sounds and to give you some tips, like here's some ways that you can help the student understand how that sound is produced. But what we do, I mean, and what all these tips do and what that book, book does is it'll say things like, okay, I'm gonna say, shh, watch what I'm doing. Feel the air coming out, shh. Oh, can you imitate it? Now let's compare, shh. did you see it stops? Oh, my tongue, and then try to describe, my tongue is stopping it. Does that make sense? So use that kind of language to describe what your mouth is doing. And another really great tip is to show them the phonogram. So show them SH and say, this says, shh, you hold on to it. And then so I'm CH, this says, shh. And then you can say, and k, and shh. So you wanna keep all those sounds going, but that visual cue, um, another really common one that students struggle with is the TH sound. Um, they don't have it. So you can then say, you can show them that phonogram and say, this says, and you show them, I stick my tongue out between my teeth. But it also says another sound. Mm. And you can have them feel your voice box, how you're turning on that, mm, your voice box to say mm, as in this and that. And then have them just practice and imitate. So describing and creating that kind of kinesthetic is what I call it, awareness of how sounds are produced and having language to describe how you make those sounds. I love that, Denise, that you're doing the um, kinesthetic awareness. I think it's really important. I'm, I'm curious if you go into the etymology of words. Oh yes, we absolutely go into etymology as well. There's a little bit of it in here. Um, Uncovering the Logic of English, this book, which is our study tonight, is really about the phonograms and spelling rules and why I think this is so key. There's a short chapter in the back that touches just a little bit on etymology. But 
we talk about etymology in our curriculum. It's completely woven in and it's woven in from very simple words like the number two. People often wonder, why does it say two? Well, we go back and we go, well, what about twins? How many are there when you have twins? Yeah. There are two. Do you hear the twa? How about 12? It's 10 and two ones. And How about 20? Yeah. It's two tens. TW, twa means two in English. And um, the, we also talk about, you know, words that end in I are not original English words. And I have, I have some great interviews with kindergartners where we would go and we would interview them about their favorite phonograms and spelling rules. One of my favorite ones is this little boy. And I asked him, what's your favorite spelling rule? And he said, English words don't end in I. And I said, why do you like that? And he said, because spaghetti isn't an English word. <laughs> and he's like, and I saw that and I asked my teacher to look it up and it's from it to Italy. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Okay, that is awesome that you um. And is that in the is that in this this book or is it in a different book that you describe those things? Yeah. So, um, morphology is completely interwoven into our foundations and our essentials curriculum, including Latin and Greek roots as the words get more difficult. Um, and so, uh. It's interwoven in curriculum. And then I believe, Donna, I'm doing a morphology or vocabulary session too, where I will just show you some of the tips of how morphology comes together. I don't remember which date that is, but Donna, okay. let it's me know. It's May 5th. May oh, 5th. ages away. <laughs> yep, got plenty of time. <laughs> another, another tip is our uh, professional development course. We actually um, released a whole bunch of our master teacher training as a parent course on that elearning.logicofenglish.com um, elearning website. And in that parent training, there's a morphology one hour presentation. So if you want it sooner, go off, go ahead and go check that out. That's also for free right now as we try to help support parents and teachers through this challenging year. Great, thank you. Okay, does anyone else have anything they wanna add? Um, please unmute and ask. Someone I asked about uh, syllables. Oh, thirty-three people in there. Shh, baby. <laughs> um, we have a struggle with uh, syllables and learning. You know, where do they begin or end? For example. Yeah, you know, this is so interesting to me. But syllables are challenging, mm -hmm. and one of the reasons they're challenging is this you actually need to know the phonograms and spelling rules to know for sure where a syllable divides. So for example, you have the word paper and we know that the syllable will divide after the A because A, E, O, U usually say they're long sounds at the end of the syllable. But then you have the word cabin and there's only one B there by the way. It divides after the B because that's closing the syllable. And many programs oversimplify syllables and try to say, well, it'll always be closed when there's a double letter. Well, it's true that the double letters will divide between, but that doesn't tell you if the letter will be doubled in the spelling and where the syllable will be. Does that make sense? Or where it will break for the pronunciation. So to be honest, even though my team has a very deep knowledge of linguistics and the phonograms and rules, we still sometimes reference the dictionary to make sure where the syllable divides are. But I wanna give you a word of caution. Some dictionaries don't use linguistic syllable divides. They use morphological syllable divides. So they keep the morphemes together, but they're not dividing it based on pronunciation. And Right off the top of my head, I'm forgetting which dictionaries do which, but we are as a team very aware. Does that make sense when it we're does. looking it up to check it? <clears throat> um, so we are through uh, the foundations with him. He's in Whistling Wales and my daughter is in Essentials and she's in eight through 15 and we're level A. Um, and so we're going to still be learning more phonograms and then morphemes as well but so we'll learn around what lesson we should be able to do that well so um 
in essentials, there are some lessons about how to divide syllable types. And I don't have it in front of me with the scope and sequence to tell you where, but essentials teaches it a little differently than a lot of Orton Gillingham programs. We teach vowel types as opposed to syllable types because understanding the vowels will help you know where the syllables divide. So if you look in the scope and sequence, all those vowel type lessons will be helping you to develop the skills to divide syllables. You'll also know this in our spelling analysis curriculum, we always give the student the syllable divides mm -hmm. because um, that is knowledge that you have to have a pretty deep knowledge to get it correct. Now that said, when you're reading, um, kids will be able to, they start to learn where they divide based on their rules and that, those sorts of things. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, my kids are both dyslexic, dysgraphic, and ADHD, but um, so they're doing logic of English with me. And then we also have a, a cult um, three times a week that does BLS with them. And so when we do our phonograms with logic of English, you know, we say a, 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 and then they go to BLS and then they have to say it totally differently. It's like three different words, I think. Apple, I don't know. I don't know what the words are, but they're like, well, we have to learn how to do it in two different ways. And so it's, it's really challenging. And so I, I'm trying to decide, well, what do I do about this? Do they just have to learn it? Because I'm, your program to me is intuitive in that you have all the rules and I don't know that they're getting that when they disjoint the different words basically with the other program right. um, to, to give you the sounds. They're learning, a, you know, how many ever sounds there are there or phonograms there are, they're learning that many words for each phonogram. Right. Um, and they, they know the phonograms that we're doing, but I think it's frustrating for them. Do you have any recommendations for us? I think this goes back to what I was saying about the classroom and students with various learning challenges. They need more time with the material to develop mastery, but we need to be careful that we're not teaching them different information in the two settings, because that's gonna be really confusing. That would be like saying two plus two equals four and then going someplace else and going, actually two plus two is five. <laughs> and, or does that make sense? Like, so you, you wanna be careful that you're reinforcing the same concepts. Now that said, they can come from different directions. You know, you can do it in reading words, you can do it by spelling words, you can do it with different games. Like there's a lot of ways to get at the same concepts, but they shouldn't be getting different knowledge. Does that make sense? And yeah. I don't know enough about the program. And I also, I, I feel very strongly that if programs are linguistically largely accurate, you know, many OG programs, for example, don't include A-U-G-H. And Logic of English does. Why do we? Well, the word daughter includes A-U-G-H. And a very common word in children's books, laugh, includes A-U-G-H, which is a high frequency word in children's books. And as a woman, I felt like, you know, a lot of the high frequency word lists that were used to generate the phonograms didn't include women. And I thought we have to include the AUGH phonogram for our daughters and for our girls, right? But where am I going with this? If, if an OG program doesn't include that as a basic phonogram, but also has, you know, most of them right, go for it. That's great. Does that make sense? Like having a linguistically accurate program is what's important there can be minor differences that we can't have big differences. And so I'm not kind of in the position to discern that for your programs and your kids, but maybe that provides you some guidelines. Well, I, I had been thinking already that we're gonna have to scrap one of the two and it, um, I, I don't know which one <laughs> because it's me teaching them versus you know, a specialist, but that's kind of how we got into this position to begin with was me giving them over to somebody else that I thought would do right by them. And 
then it was hidden from us sadly their their performance um mm -hmm. until it couldn't be any longer and so um yeah i'm sorry um, yeah it's a long journey with struggling readers sometimes Janie, can I can I suggest something? Can you still help out your children at home, just like Denise did with her own children, to fill those laundry baskets with books and all the stuff that you're learning from from this logic of English, um, apply it with in context with the books. And if the kids, your children are struggling, then you can teach you know, at that moment with that specific word, um, the rule maybe, but so that they're enjoying the book, you're there to rescue them when they struggle mm -hmm. and you are prepared because you know all the rules. So you are gonna be, you know, the reading teacher by reading instead of, but you will be also teaching them the rules, but without the, um, the sequence that Denise has in the program. And the kids will receive the all the other instruction in the classroom and whatever they're learning in there, they'll apply it. But when they struggle at home with you, you'll rescue them with making English logical. Mm -hmm. um, and may I say something? This is Teresa Franks. I am a I am a, a CALT, we call it a CALT, a Certified Academic Language Therapist. Talk to your cow and ask the questions. Now you have a knowledge base, ask the questions why. Um, because CALTs can be trained in, in different ways, but we all have to take an exam. We all have to, um, we also have professional ethics. So, talk to this person and ask the questions because um, to get the clarity on what their um, justification is. And also maybe there is, um, maybe there's not clarity on exactly what's happening. But if you find that what is happening is um, not above board, then please go to Alta and, you know, make that known because we do have to, um, you know, abide by ethics. I mean, I think um, to build on that, um, this is Louise, um, just um, often I find students can read a word but not spell it. Um, can you expand on that? Yeah, absolutely. I, that was me. <laughs> I, you know, I learned to read just fine, but even though I was in the, you know, third of students that could read well, I couldn't spell at all. Uh -huh. And so there's this myth in U.S. culture that if you read a lot, you'll be able to spell well. And that is just simply not true because so many of us were taught to read with this kind of, I, I like to call it a mixture of funny phonics and sight words and rote memorization. It's just this whole conglomeration, right? But mostly it's that inconsistent funny phonics part that just doesn't hold up. And um, so I could apply the parts I knew. So these rules, these phonograms are the key to helping all students also become strong spellers. And something that's just a personal story for mine, and partly why I wrote Uncovering the Logic of English, was, you know, I'm practicing the phonograms motivated by my sons, right? And they're in a, they're my desire for them to become strong readers. But as I'm practicing them, when, them with them, and as I'm helping them apply it to spell words, my own spelling improves. So what happened is I used to not be able to keep the spell check, the underline on, because it was so discouraging to me. Mm -hmm. And then I'd have to set aside time to spell check something. And that's so embarrassing when you're a professional. And, <laughs> but now I will be typing along and I'll be like, oh, it's underlined, must be the other spelling at E. Oh, not that one. Oh, it's the third one. And I don't even really miss a beat because I know all the options. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Another thing I often do, which this just shocked me, 
to be honest, I was at a very large conference and I was getting some pushback in the room about the value of teaching the phonograms and spine rules to all students. And so I asked this question, and this has now become standard across my presentations when I'm um, working professional, uh, professional development. I'll ask people, how many of you have ever abandoned the perfect word because you couldn't get spell check to recognize it? Do you all relate to this, by the way? Well, I mean, that was going to be my question, and and I thank you for addressing this, like uh, homophones and homonyms, well, homophones or homonyms, you know. Yeah, well, let's just go to this question, though, about just completely giving up on a word. I don't do that anymore, because now I know all the options. Does that make sense? Like, if it doesn't recognize it, I know that there are multiple spellings of a particular sound, and I can try the other one, and I'm able to get it, and I know how to break down the word. And then with homophones and homonyms, you know, two, like two, the number two, if you once tell your students things like twin, twice, 12, they're gonna know that the TW01 is the number two, and they're probably not going to forget that. And so, and then TO and TOO, you know, those are a little bit trickier. You do have some rote memory and remembering which one is which, but at least they're both spelled how they look. Does that make sense? Like there's no exceptions to the sounds there. So there are those homophone pieces. And one of the things I do in professional developments too is um, people often tell me, well, English is, you know, full of homophones. We actually don't have the most homophones of languages. Uh, if you ever look, look up the poem, just Google this sometime if you want to be amused, amused. Google a YouTube video for the poem Shishi. Shi. It is a Chinese poem with homophones that's an entire poem of one word. Like it sounds all the same to me. <laughs> and so this is not unique to English. Does that make sense? This concept of words having the same sound but multiple spellings. But the powerful thing is, is you begin to understand that many words are spelled differently to distinguish homophones. And there's a lot of tricks you can use to figure out why which one is which way. <clears throat> All right, Thanks. Denise, thank you. It is eight o'clock. It is time to end our wonderful discussion. Um, I encourage all of you to go to her website. There's lots of information there. We have a question about teaching adult literacy that I'm going to send to you. Um, to It's from one of our members and we can get that answered. Um, and I'm looking forward to our next series and some possible training this summer, correct? Yes, we are looking at taking our four day professional development and offering it in an online live format for you over the summer. So look forward to that folks. All right, Denise, I even took notes and learned a lot. So thank you so much. Thank you You're so, so welcome. much. It was a wonderful event. Thank you well, thank everyone you for coming. Christine. Denise, You're can I ask you, can I ask you a quick question? I know we stopped it already, but how long does it take to teach one lesson? Like if I'm creating my schedule in the classroom, how many minutes do I need to block for this type of instruction? Um, I'm gonna answer that with a question that I, I don't know anything about your context. I don't know your students, I don't know what your program is. So it really just depends. I mean, our foundations curriculum in foundations A starts with very short lessons because the students are very young and they're like 15 minutes long per, per lesson. And by the end of foundations D, many of the people break it up into two, one lesson into two because they're reading an entire children's book as well as doing spelling and comprehension and writing, you know, composition activities based on that book. And those are closer to two hours in length, but some teachers divide it up, if that makes sense. And with our mm -hmm. older essentials curriculum, um, the units are divided across a week. And I have been videoing all the main content. You know, it depends. I don't have all the back and forth interaction with a student. And so that sort of piece that can make it longer. But I. I think you could accomplish a, a lesson within the unit within half an hour to at the most an hour, depending on the unit, so. Okay, thank you.
Yeah, you're welcome. I've been following you since 2013. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you. It's been quite a journey. <laughs> mm -hmm. I remember you. Yep, yep. You were just starting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow, that's You've great. Grown. You've developed. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, Susanna. Yep. That's so encouraging. Mm -hmm. If we if we send questions, Denise, uh, through your website that we weren't able to get to this evening, would you be willing to answer some of those if they're specific to um, some of the spelling rules and things that you cover in your book? Yeah, the contact us page will get to our support team. They are fabulous. Perfect. And if they are overwhelmed and unable to answer kind of everything coming in, they come to me. <laughs> or if it's really hard, so try to challenge them. We'll see what you send them. <laughs> but I'll do my yeah, best. <laughs> we would Thank love you. to um, answer your questions. Okay, awesome. Thanks. All right, I think that might be it. Thanks again, Denise. This is amazing. It was great. Um, um, Donna, will you post? Uh, did I hear that correctly in the beginning? There's five. Is that right? There's, Denise is going to do five more of these. Five more sessions. Mm -hmm. I'm not. How do we sign up for that? I, I feel like I missed that. Okay, go to www.scienceofreadinginfo.com. And go to the events page. Okay, got it. Okay. Terrific, thank you. You're welcome. And this will be posted on my YouTube channel, just Donna Heitmanic. Uh, and I'll also put it on the Science of Reading site, but it can get lost there very easily. So it'll go on the YouTube channel. All right, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. -bye. Okay, we're good. I'm glad you got in, Randy. Uh, can you hear me? I can. Oh, good. I'm volunteering to teach adult literacy at a local library. And can we get certified or go through a curriculum or program for... Uh, for an older group of people. I mean, I'd love to learn this. I don't know if they have a program or not, but I mean, I have a degree in Russian and I've studied eight other languages. This is by far the best explanation of English I have ever seen. Wow. And I'm, uh, I teach ESL. I had 6,500 conversations with 4,300 students in 85 countries last year. And I have a couple kids who want to learn to read. We only do conversation, but I'm using logic of English as my basis to help people learn to read now. I, I'm just barely starting to learn. So I'm really, really interested in this. So Randy, uh, this is Denise. You would probably really enjoy a, a couple things. One, our master teacher training. It's on our website. Okay. It, it's a really in-depth program. Um, if you're not, uh, if you want to just get the videos for that program, the parent course that we have is the videos for that master teacher training program. Um, another option for you is those free essentials light courses on the elearning.logicofenglish.com. Those you could just share with your students for free. Okay. Um, Otherwise, the Essentials program itself is used, uh, it was really designed for older struggling students or older students who need to learn more about spelling. And it has three different levels of spelling lists and spelling analysis within it. Yeah. Uh, it has lots of vocabulary. I have a background in teaching ELL. It also includes grammar so and morphology. So you may find that just to be a really beneficial part of teaching and tutoring if you want to add in the written language. I will start out with as much of free stuff because that's really all I can afford. But I will never get paid back for whatever I invest in this. But, but this is something I really want to do. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, thank so. you for, for serving and teaching others. It's so important. And that's why we have a wealth of free materials out there yeah. as well. So. Well, if you think the cost of education is expensive, consider the cost of not getting an education. That is way more expensive. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And as a nation, we need to solve this. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, All right. What I read. Good night, everybody. Thank All you, right. Randy. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.